Hello, everyone. Charlotte, North Carolina and surrounding areas. Welcome to this latest installment of Under Construction. I'm your host for the day, Jamal, the angry black fan, Darby. To my right, partner in crime, Mr. Kaiser Sose. Kaiser, what's good, brother? What's good, y'all? You know, man, us two holding it down today, man. Rodney is living his best rich life once again and is traveling on the road. So we will see Rodney maybe Thursday, because I think Thursday we may try to have a show for the NBA draft. And I know Kaz is on the trade to pick train, man. Has that changed? <laughs> it has not. Well, uh, you know, I've been watching a lot of uh, film on Kai Jones. And if he's available, I kind of feel like the Hornets should make a move there. Uh, I don't think he's necessarily even the best player available, but um, I think that he might be the best player available for the Hornets when they pick. And right. he feels a need. I'm not too big on having another guy come in that we got to wait to develop. And, you know, big men in today's NBA take a long time to develop because the skill set has changed. Having said that, he's a bit of an athletic freak. And that's kind of what the Hornets would really – uh, that need at their their position. They need someone who's going to be able to put in the effort defensively, be able, be able to get out, run the floor. Uh, he's a bit undersized as far as weight, so you know he's going to have to work on that pick and roll game with Lamelo. But I like that pick, and if he's available, I think the Hornets uh, should take him. Otherwise, yeah. I'd be fine with trading the pick. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to save who I like for this upcoming draft. Uh, we, we're going to save some, man. I'm, I'm kind of with you and Kai Jones. However, there are some other intriguing prospects out there, man. There is one. I I'll talk about one. I I'll give our audience one guy I'm really kind of looking at because I am a UConn guy, and I've seen this guy for myself, Mr. Uh, James Booknight. Uh, complete boom or bust pick, man. When I tell you the horns are really rolling the dice if they take a look at that young man because there's so much a, a, a great upside, but you just worry about his maturity, um, his 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 you know can, can he be consistent on the NBA level, man? But again, I'm gonna save some for this upcoming Thursday because I think we're gonna have a hard ton to talk about as far yeah. as that goes with the draft coming up, man. Well, I, I trust Mitch. Mitch has yeah. really knocked it out of the park in the last few seasons. And I know uh, – actually, I, I mean, drafting LaMelo was kind of the easy pick because of the best three in the draft, he was the only one left. But, you know, he still picked him. And I feel like I uh, did a great job with Miles Bridges, P.J. Washington, and Devontae Graham. I don't think that can be debated. Right. So I, I trust whatever Mitch decides to do with the pick, um, I'm, I'm good with that. All right. So – but – for now, man, let's talk about uh, a team who maybe will give the Hornets some hope for the future. Let's talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. <laughs> you got one right. Uh, Under construction got one right. We, we, well, y'all got one right because I, I wasn't really on the train too much, man. But <laughs> but congratulations to the Milwaukee Bucks, man. Uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo is the MVP of the finals, as he probably should have been. Um, winning four straight against the Suns, man. Uh, Kaza, I want to steal your thunder for a second, man. Um, last week you said momentum is everything. Now, having said that, did you foresee the Bucks winning four straight to win this thing? Well, in the predictions last week, I felt like the Bucks would would certainly win game five, and I predicted them to close it out in game six because I knew they didn't want to go back to Phoenix. They did not want to try – you know, they play in Milwaukee. Y'all don't if y'all never been to Phoenix, hey dog, this time of year, it's it's miserable in Phoenix. And I know all my family in Phoenix and I'd be like, Hey, what are you talking about? It's not miserable. Dog, I used to spend my summers in Phoenix growing up. You don't wanna you don't wanna go back there in that under ten degree weather. I just don't think they want to go back and play from that hostile crowd and give uh Chris Paul a chance. Um and you know, I, I knew that it would be a tough game, but I think that Giannis figured out. We said this some last week. He figured out I'm the best player on the court. Right. The best player in the series, nobody can stop me. So that's that's what he did, and that's what big time players do during the NBA Finals. They realize you guys can't stop me, so I'm gonna score. You're gonna have to find some other way to beat us. Speaking of Giannis, dude, fifty points. 14 rebounds, five blocks. That might be the dumbest stat line I've ever seen in the NBA Finals, and that includes Michael Jordan and LeBron James, who have put up absurd stats in the Finals. Which brings me to my question, man. Uh, this is a very hot, takey question, but 
with this performance, man, it has to be asked, man, where do you rank this finals performance amongst the others, amongst the LeBrons and the Michaels and whoever, man? Where do you rank this, man? Oh, boy. So you have to look at the opponent, for one. Uh, the Phoenix Suns are as good as any opponent that Michael Jordan faced, except maybe that people underrate that Lakers, that 91 Lakers team. That was yeah, absolutely. Team. Absolutely. Was team. Um, in considering that, I think that objectively, if you look at both teams, they seem evenly matched, but I think a lot of people felt would feel like the Phoenix Suns had the most, more explosive team right? outside of Gian, uh, Giannis. So, uh, you know, I think that that counts. Um, you got you have to put it up there because I mean he really just I mean especially in Game Six where Jerry Holiday and Chris Middleton were pretty average. Yeah, looking, you know, uh, Chris Middleton is that guy that you feel like you can depend on and get a bucket, and he made some clutch shots down the stretch in the fourth quarter. But for the most part, of that game he was largely forgotten about, which was you know. Kind of surprising because Giannis decided that he was just going he was just going to get off, and you know the Suns had focused their efforts on him, so that left the floor open for Middleton and, and Drew Holiday, and um, I, I got I got to put it up there. I mean, yeah, I, I'm with you, man. I I'm, I won't put a number on it, man, but it is as dominant as I've ever seen, man. And, and I think one thing that people are not going to talk about so much as far as the dominance is on the defensive end, like you know. Yeah. Fans, fans don't, I know defense is not the sexy thing to talk about. But one thing I, I, I noticed in that game, man, like when the Bucks were switching, they switched everything on defense. Nobody could do anything against Giannis. Not the point guards, not the small fours, not nobody. Nobody, nobody. scored on Giannis when he when he when he switched his defensive assignment, man. And then on top of that, he had the five block shots. That is dominance on another level, man. Not just the 50 points is the obvious. Stat line that obviously jumps out at you, man. But stopping everybody in front of your tracks from scoring is something that I think you people know, take it for granted. It reminds me of now. I'm not. I don't want to compare DeAndre Ayton to Shaquille O'Neal because that's two vastly different yeah, yeah, yeah. players. Right. But if you remember when Shaq faced off against Akeem Olajuwon back in the uh, 95 96 finals, uh, you know Shaq was this up. Coming star, he'd only been in the league what for three, four seasons, and here he was going up against you know a guy who was the league MVP, um, and yeah, he just got shut down. They just, I mean, they wouldn't. Everyone remembers that series between Houston and Orlando, and I mean, Hakeem Olajuwon showed why he was at least at that time probably the best player in the league because Jordan right. retired. Absolutely, I the same thing happened here. DeAndre Aiden had been getting a lot of press for being. Like, hey, that's an up-and-coming rising star. Look how much he's contributed to Phoenix success. And he was nowhere near – he didn't even deserve Listen. to be on the same court as Giannis. I no, mean, no, 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 no. DeAndre Ayton might not have been, might not have deserved to be on the floor, period. He looked lost. He, he yeah. looked like a lost puppy out there, man. And, and, you know, he got in foul trouble, and then Frank Kaminsky had to come in and guard Giannis. I remember thinking, oh, that's, that's – Oh, God, what a disaster. Right <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> No, but man, DeAndre Ayton, man, I, look, man, I don't want to come down too hard on this young man. He's a, he's a young kid, man. He's going to get together. He's going to be a good player. Four for 12, 12 points, man, but he hurt his team. I, I just, we got to call a spade a spade, man. He missed a lot of easy buckets, man. He got lost on the defensive end a lot, man. I, and again, I just think the moment was a little too big for DeAndre Ayton, and, and it played a big part in the Suns getting off to such a slow start in that game, which ultimately probably cost him the game. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, Phoenix is going to be tough uh, to know where they stand next season. Yeah. Chris Paul's going to be a year older. If if he decides to stay, How uh, is he still going to be as effective as he was? And we talked about this earlier in the playoffs. Health was a major concern throughout the playoffs. This is as deep as Chris Paul has ever gone on a playoff run. Right. And he had, uh, you know, injuries throughout this playoff run. Um you know, how much would that affect him in the long run? So he's, you know, next season, he's not going to have the long break that he that he is accustomed to because he had to play in the NBA Finals, six games. Um, is, is the Phoenix Suns going to be a real interesting team uh, next season? Um, 
Whereas I, I think the Bucks, Bucks uh, may be lined up to be a contender over the next few years. I mean, if, if Giannis, if he's finally ascended to what we all figured he, the kind of player. Uh, he I, he's there. He's there, yeah. bro. <laughs> then you're going to have a, a real, real tough time. I mean, of course, there's Brooklyn, but the Celtics aren't, you know, as good as, as they were a few seasons ago, even though they have a nice young core. Um, it, it's funny you mentioned the Brooklyn Nets. That is foreshadowing. We're going to save that subtopic for uh, – we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that because that's a hot hot button topic that we need to tackle, man. But one question I wanted to ask you, man, CP3, man, how much smoke does he deserve? Does he deserve smoke? Does he deserve criticism for, for the Suns lo- losing the series? Nah, uh, if, if we're talking, if this was like the 2007 CP3, maybe because he was in his, you know, relative prime or entering his prime then. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think now, I mean, he, the difference he made on the Phoenix Suns this season cannot be understated. They don't make it to the finals without Chris. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, they, they, they just don't. So, um, really, I'm going to give most of the smoke for this to guys like, like uh like Devin Booker. Uh Devin, Devin, Booker, De- Devin Booker, eight for twenty-two. Yeah. Nineteen points. Uh, and I granted this was Devin Booker's first time on the big stage and it may not be his last. Right. But you know, that's just a growing pain that you have to go through. You you know, some players have to go through that. Devin Booker's always gonna remember. I right out, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm mean, but whenever a team loses the big game, I always love when they show the loser's reaction. Right. You know, even though it, it stings when like Josh Norman is crying on the bench because the Panthers lost the Super Bowl, but I like to see that kind of stuff actually. <laughs> and they switch to Devin Booker, and he's just sitting there with his hands on his hips, and he goes, "Damn." You know, I mean, I because he he knew he was that close, and in the NBA, you may never get another chance again. So I think he's going to carry that with him, and this was real good for him. But in the, this moment of space and time, you know, he just he came up small. And the Bucks had a really good defensive plan on him as well. They, I mean, um, I, look, man, not to toot my own horn, but it goes back to what I was saying. They were switching everything, man, yeah. and they got three guys—not just Giannis, but they got three guys who can lock you up, man. Middleton, Holiday, and Giannis. I, look, man, that, those are not three players that that, that you you're scared to switch everything on. So, yep. yeah. So, yeah. Congrats to the Bucks. Uh, Hornets fans don't get too excited. I don't think this this signals a switch to the the small market team winning. Uh, this was just, I mean, Giannis is one of the best players in basketball. Um, it was kind of an odd season, a lot of injuries. You really can't discount that. But 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 wait, Kaza, why why wouldn't you give the a team like the Hornets some hope, man? They're they're a mid market team like the Hornets are. They 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 built through the draft. How come we can't do the same thing? I mean, you, you never know. I, I feel like the Hornets in the next three, four seasons will end up being a very competitive team on the strength of LaMelo Ball's development. If, I mean, I, I you can't, you look at LaMelo Ball and you think, hmm, future superstar. And if that turns out to be true, then the Hornets will be competitive and then anything is possible. I mean, no one, I, I'm not going to say no one pegged the Bucks to win the championship, but a lot of people had the Brooklyn Nets slotted into the NBA finals one way or another. I, I did. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. <laughs> Why could you not? Especially after the James Harden trade. So you know that it just didn't work out. And Milwaukee, I think them losing in the bubble last year, or not? Uh, yeah, last year to uh, to Miami. Yeah, that stung because yeah. I, I, for one, I think if they had not been in the bubble, my, Milwaukee would have won that series. Uh, and I think that that just stung. That stuck with them this whole season because. They knew they were the better team. They and just, not, yeah. not, not only that, man, I, I actually think that made Giannis an even better player, man, because oh, yeah, I, I tell you what, man, for, for all of his talent and, and for all of his ability, man, I like I love his attitude and I love his competitive nature, man. That That, that is a dude who hates to lose. We, we saw him throw shade at the super teams. You know, basically saying, man, hey, I did it the hard way. I, I could have done it the easy way, which he's not really lying. You could take that, <laughs> you could take that how you want to, but you could tell this is a dude, man, who who is who is very competitive, and he wants to take on the best of the best, man, to show that he's the best. And right. it, this dominant performance, man, it gives that credence, man. Yeah, ab- absolutely. 
I think the only thing that's going to hinder him as far as legacy is playing in Milwaukee. I don't mm. know if Milwaukee will be like uh, dynastic, like like guys like LeBron James. You know, LeBron mm. James with the like nine straight NBA Finals. On these teams, Michael Jordan six six and zero. Oh, and the, I don't know if you if Giannis if Giannis will ever reach like those that practices. level, right? Mainly because the East will be, I think, very competitive in the next few years. But um, you know. If he continues on this path down uh, throughout his career, you're gonna have to start. We're gonna have to start having some serious conversations about guys like him, Kevin Durant. You know, LeBron will probably be retired in the next three seasons, and you're gonna have guys that are gonna break these records that LeBron set. Giannis is probably gonna be one of them, and then yeah. but that's really gonna open the door uh, for conversation about greatness so so look man so so not to not to not to delay this subject any anymore man we got to talk about it man does, does this quote unquote end the super team era or does it even or, or does it uh jump start it again what do you think about that uh no the best <laughs> way to win an nba championship is to play with the best players in the league right it's as, it's as simple as that um i think a lot of the players fans in the league knows that Injuries played a part. And I know people say, well, injuries happen every season. And that's true. But these are some significant injuries we're talking about. We talked about this last week. Kawhi Leonard, Anthony Davis, uh, James Harden, Kyrie Irvin, uh, Jamal Murray. You're just talking about, like, like literally the best players in the league were just falling off like flies. And that kind of opened the door for teams like Phoenix and Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, so I think – until you can prove outright the super team method does not work, it's always and and honestly it does work. You look at, I mean, Golden State was already good, and then they added Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant, I mean, hello. The only time they were beat was when Durant and Clay Thompson were injured in against Toronto, uh, and then you know look at the Lakers last season. You know, LeBron James finally gets. At the time, Anthony Davis, you could have said he was easily the second best player at the league. You have the, the two best players in the league on the same team. I, I still say Anthony Davis should have won finals MVP, but don't, don't, don't get me started. So uh, uh, this this season, I'm not going to call it an anomaly because I think there will be other like non-super teams that, that are competitive, but I don't think they'll ever. Plus, all these elite players, they, they're friends. They like each other. They're not rivals like in the 80s and 90s. Right. Like right. they hang out and play ball during the offseason. They want to play together. Yeah, I look, man. Let, let me take off my objective podcast host hat for a second and let me put on my fan hat for a minute. I'm actually afraid this is my this may even kind of jump start super teams even more. I mean, you, you look at and look, these are just rumors. Let me be very clear. But you, you know, you look at the the rumors kind of flying around now about, you know, Dame Lillard and Russell Westbrook and even Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan have been rumored. You know, of course, every season, everybody has to go to the Lakers the next season. We know how this works. But with that being said, man, you know, who, who's to say these players are around the league aren't looking at a team like Milwaukee saying, you know what, they're good, man. But if I go team up with such and such, we can easily beat this team. You know what I mean? So, um, again, we'll see what happens. We got a whole – what month or two to really kind of talk, talk about and see what happens in free agency, man. But I'm also afraid that it may jumpstart this thing again. Man. <laughs> and let me right. be clear. I don't like the quote unquote super teams. I, for, for anybody who's trying to guess, I I'm not a fan of it myself, man. So we'll, we'll see how it works. All right. Speaking of super teams, I want to talk about a not so super team team USA. <laughs> they lost <laughs> in a game that counts today against Nick Batum and the Frenchman. Yeah, not a good look, man. Simple question. What is going on with Team USA? First, let me say this. France, <clears throat> excuse me, the France na men's national basketball team is a very good team, actually. Yeah, they, they consistently have, have been. Yeah. Yeah, for a long time. They have the best defensive player in the league. Who, who Rodney yeah. hates, but you yeah, know, yeah. Three time defensive player of the year, three time all star. Um, they got Evan Fournier, who was pretty good and, and will be a highly sought after free agent once he enters free agency. And then they got Nick Batum, who always decides to play well in these international games. I, you know, so I, it's not like France was like chopped liver, right? Granted, from 
a pure talent perspective, you would expect the United States team to be, uh, you know, to, to be favored, to be, if not dominant, winning. But we saw in the, the preliminary rounds, there's, there's some chemistry issues there. Um, plus, <clears throat> international basketball has changed, has evolved so much, like separate from the NBA, and that is really difficult for NBA players to make that adjustment. We've seen that even on the, the, the United States has won four straight gold medals. We've seen them have to make that adjustment uh, in the early rounds. The, the the you know the rules are different, the referees are different. It's not the NBA, so you're playing against these guys who are used to playing. FIBA international basketball for one, so that's a disadvantage. Jeru Holiday didn't even get into Japan until one o'clock in the morning today. Right, right. So, so there's some logistic issues. There's a lot of things that, and, and international basketball has caught up to the point where NBA players just cannot walk onto the court and just win games just from from being better. There's there's all of these um, logistical challenges that. NBA players have to face now. And if they're not prepared to face them, then they're going to lose games like this. And, I, you know, to me, I mean, I really hate to say this because I love the guy, but that's Greg, That's on Greg Popovich. Yeah. You know, hey, look, and, and let me cut you off for a second, man. And the, the alarming thing about Greg Popovich, let, let me be very clear, man. Greg Popovich is, you know, one of the greatest coaches we've ever seen in the NBA, should be highly respected. But in this particular scenario with, with Team USA, he sounds like he doesn't have a clue. And I say that because he's even alluded to the fact that he doesn't even know what to do with the guys that he has on this roster. He said it himself. I'm not, you know, trying to overly criticize Greg Popovich. But I just wonder, man, speaking of chemistry is issues, are there chemistry issues between Brian Colangelo, who is ultimately responsible for the roster, and Greg Popovich? So much has changed, and, and that affects the, the chemistry and the consistency. Mm -hmm. We have, a, um, you know, you got Grant Hill, who's going to be the president of, of the USA basketball uh, coming in the next week or two. Uh, you have almost a complete roster turnover. To your point, you have Drew Holiday and Devin Booker, who just finished the NBA Finals, coming on to a team that they haven't played with yet. You have uh, they added JaVale McGee about a week ago. You got guys coming in and out with, with COVID-related stuff or, or people who are just dropping out for whatever reason. All of this stuff is playing a major factor, man, and it's it's showing itself right now. Can they recover from that? Plus, the, you know, the roster makeup has been criticized since day one. It's almost like they feel like Kevin Durant is the great equalizer. Like you right. can put a bunch of – and I mean, there are a lot of good players on the – the, the uh, United States roster, Dame Willard, Devin Booker, obviously. But the thing is, is they're not necessarily even the best players in competition. Like JaVale McGee versus Rudy Gobert, that's not even that, – that's, that's not – yeah. Ten right. years ago, JaVale McGee would have been one of the best players on the on, – one of the best big men on the court in international basketball. Now, not, like not, not – he's not even one of the best big men on the court in the, in the league that he plays in. Dude, it's like it's Mark Gasol, it's Rudy Gobert. I mean, it's a bunch of guys. Yeah. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I think the roster makeup is just kind of like, and plus, I don't know if international basketball is that important to NBA players anymore. It used to be winning a gold medal was very prestigious. You know, it was like something you almost felt obligated to do ever since the Dream Team. Okay, these guys went gold medals. You know, Michael Jordan had one. You know, before when he was a college player. But, you know, it's like a lot of NBA players feel like, okay, I got to go defend the honor of the United States basketball because we're the NBA, we're the greatest league in the world. So we're going to go defend their honor. And, you know, it's, it's been mixed results as, as international basketball has caught up. And I, I don't think these NBA players – I mean, Kevin Durant already has a gold medal. You know, I don't think he cares. Right. You know. And, and, and plus, you know, one thing we're not talking about, man, is just the timing of all this. Man. We, we know COVID has kind of, you know, rampaged and ravaged, you know, everything. But we're talking about, you know, a basketball season that has gone well into July. <laughs> and then yeah. you got guys. Yeah. Most of these guys were in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like how, how much time, you know, you don't really even have time to really transition from your NBA stuff to USA basketball stuff, and you don't even get to play together with these guys, man. And it, it just goes to prove a point 
that you can't just throw a bunch of talent on a team and say, all right, guys, go win. It, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, that's not going to work uh, anymore. Plus, I, I think, uh, although, you know, Popovich has good Olympic chops, you know, Coach K was always part of these Olympic coaching staff, you know, with him not there anymore. I think he was more in tuned to the, the FIBA game, which is probably closer to collegiate basketball than it is in the NBA, actually. So um, having said that, I'm not betting against the United States uh, from here on out. Um, their next two games are against Iran and the Czech Republic. Now, if you lose either of those two games, DEFCON five it is on the plane and bring you just get on the plane and come back, home. man. <laughs> I'm back home. You cannot lose France. I'll give you that. France was actually a pretty good international team, but Iran and the Czech Republic. Come on, dog. You can't. You can't do that. You got to win them games by fifty apiece. I, I, I'll do I'll, look, you. Look, you just kind of stole my thunder. I'll do you one better. You can't even struggle with those teams, man. Those yeah, have to yeah, be blowouts. You better be throwing alley oops and shoot. Yeah, you can't go. They went four and a half minutes scoreless against France to close the game out. That's unacceptable. When you got yeah. that many scores and shooters, uh, yes, yeah, unacceptable. I, I'm gonna tell you what else is unacceptable. NBC wants us wants us to pay to watch this crap. <laughs> nope. <laughs> If that is not a sign of U.S. capitalism, I don't yeah. know Wrong what answer. is. Wrong answer, NBC. People <laughs> people care, like, this much about the Olympics anyway. Uh, yeah, no. No, I'm <laughs> not doing it, man. All right, man. Um, maybe we have a future Olympian because Leangelo Ball has signed with the Charlotte Hornets Summer League roster. Yes, I'm being facetious, everyone. Um it is made. Uh, Leandro Ball is, is, is has robbed the Charlotte man. We saw the pictures of him working out, and there was speculation, but now it is official, man. Leandro will be on the summer league roster, man. Uh, what are your expectations for Mr. Ball on the summer league roster? I expect him actually to play well. I know we talked a lot of smack about him last week, but you know, summer league is summer league, yeah. And, and Leandro Ball, he's actually a you know, he can score. We know he can shoot the ball. And I think that that will serve him well in summer league. Um, and it, I think that will eventually translate to probably a spot on the, the Greensboro Swarm. I don't know if that will directly translate, you know, to a spot with the Hornets. Um, but I think he'll he'll be in with the face of the organization for quite a while. I think he'll be associated with the team throughout most of, of this season. I actually hope he he plays well. Actually, I mean, you always you always want <laughs> uh, you always want you know anyone that's coming to your team to to ball out, right? Because right. that means that you know that we got a good one. It's just that my only problem so so, Kaz, what you're saying is you'd rather for him to play well than than for you to be right. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. I, okay. I would love for him to like. Be a Prove free what's free wrong. Free yeah. All-star. Like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, I want him to do well. But that just because I want him to do well doesn't mean, like, I have to, like, change my thinking to to, to predict that he will do well. Um, right, right, right. My, my only real beef with this whole situation was that the only reason we're looking at him because he's LaMelo Ball's brother. That's it. That's the only reason. And there's this cool thought that, well, finally Angelo keeps LaMelo happy. And that, like we said last week, winning keeps LaMelo. Winning happy. keeps them happy, right. So, you know, uh, if the Hornets build around LaMelo Ball and build a winning culture and organization, then he'll then he'll stay. And if they fail to do that, then he'll leave, and he should leave, honestly. If, yeah. if, if the Charlotte Hornets fail to build around the best player they've had in the last two and a half decades, then, yeah, he should bounce. And Leangelo Ball is going to make a difference. If the Hornets suck and Leangelo Ball is still on the team, then we've ra- we've wasted a roster. It, it's amateur hour. It is yeah, complete yeah. amateur hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me tell you something, man. I, I've been looking at, at, at some film of uh, Leangelo Ball lately, man. And, uh, you know, the, the kid the kid can shoot, man. As as I, I, I think Rodney's in the chat, but I, I think uh, what he's alluding to is his athleticism. Now – Athleticism is something that can be improved, especially when you're when you're a young player. You know, we've seen him in the gym. 
I don't know how much he slimmed down. I don't know how much quicker and faster he is, but I'm saying this because this is of dire importance for him to take this next step as far as him, you know, possibly getting on an NBA roster. The kid can't shoot, but the thing that has always concerned not just me, but with scouts with Angelo is can he guard the other teams to guard? You know, he was a little heavy. At one point, he was, what, 6'5", like 230, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and not that a- athletic. Um, Summer League is the perfect opportunity for him to show himself. Now, Summer League, as me and you know, it hardly matters. We don't make a big deal out of Summer League. But for a player like Leangelo Ball, it is of dire importance to right. shut people like me, like you, and like Rodney up. You know what I mean? He can he can truly show the Hornets and in, in the world – how he can compete at least against the guys who are in the same position as he as he's in. <laughs> Rodney calls him a stretch too. <laughs> yeah. But I mean we're we're it's joking. Powerful, honestly. But the thing we're joking, but it's a legitimate that's the concerns we had going into this thing. He's a bit of a tweener. Where do you stick him at? Because with his foot speed, you know, it's like, who's he going to guard, man? And who's he going to post up? Because he's not the fastest guy. Um, I saw something today. You know, they were kind of comparing someone like DeMar DeRozan and him. And what I mean by this is you got DeMar DeRozan who's like 6'7", 215, right? You got somebody like him who's like 6'5", 220. What are you going to do with somebody like DeMar DeRozan who has a lot more foot speed than this guy? <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's, it's just an example of how he can he possibly can struggle guarding guys in the NBA. He might be better off finding just a niche. If he can shoot. He can shoot. Now, he can't do that. The thing is, is that some players shore up their weaknesses and improve that way. Some players mm-hmm. cannot do that for whatever reason. So what they do is they capitalize on their strengths. To give another brother's example, look at Seth Curry. Seth Curry. Uh, has always been a great – he was a good shooter in college, but he wasn't good enough at, like, anything else to make right. it a NBA roster. He even – he, he still he, can't guard anybody. He but, by yeah. Golden State, uh, you know, and played along Steph, and, and that didn't work out. You know, and he went back and forth between the G League and 10-day contracts in the league before finally he was just like, you know what, I can shoot, and I can shoot better than my brother. You know, he believes that, and even Del Curry has alluded to, hey, Seth might be the best shooter in the family, and now – Seth Curry is going to get $10 million wherever he goes right. now because that's what he does. Shooting is such a, a, a you know valuable thing in today's league to where he's going to be a starting starting shooter on any NBA team. So it wasn't surprising me that LeAngelo Ball had that kind of career arc where he's like, okay, hey, I can't guard DeMar DeRozan, but I can shoot, I can shoot lights out. You know, no one's going to want to leave me open. And then he capitalizes off that and ends up being, you know, valuable in, in the NBA. I guess the question is, you know, can he do what the Hornets need him to do? Right. Uh, look, and, and the Hornets definitely could use the shooting. Let, let, let's, you know, we, let, let's be let's be fair about that, man. One question I wanted to ask, man, and this this may sound a little, I don't know, extra for lack of a better term. Is this do or die for him? Like, is this kind of like a last chance for him? Uh, you know, not not to say that he's had like a ton of chances. He's still a very young man, but. You know, is this the last chance for him to kind of show show the NBA what he's what he's got? I think so. I mean, teams talk, right? I mean, they, they do. The, the, trust me, the Charlotte Hornets have talked to the Detroit Pistons about Leandro Ball, so they're going to take whatever they say into consideration. They may take it with a grain of salt, and they're going to be looking at for those weaknesses and see if he's improved on some of those things. If you go into the summer league and you cannot stand out in the summer league. Then you're in trouble because right, league, right. We league guys, you know, these are they're all, they're all in the same position, right? Yeah, I mean, barely above collegiate skill level, you're trying to make it into the league. You've got to show that you are just far and away better than those guys. And if he cannot do that, then yeah, he's going to be in trouble. He'll because I mean, because he's one of the ball brothers, he may always have his name attached to basketball in some capacity, but uh. You know, and and if this goes for any player at his level, you work hard, you never know what might happen. You know, just like Seth Curry. Um, or PJ Tucker. Or PJ, yeah, yeah, PJ Tucker. Um, you might have to go overseas like PJ Tucker did, uh, you know, get some uh development there 
and then come back and be valuable to the NBA. Which he kind of already had. I mean, look, not not to say that the journey is is over for him, but you know, keep in mind he, he you know he was playing with Lithuania, mm-hmm. and he had a pretty average kind of uh, stint there. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so just kind of just kind of keep that in mind, man. It's funny you mention that because our our, our brother Vince posted a, a video, or maybe he didn't, but he I, I, actually he did. He posted a video in the Hornets Facebook group uh, this morning. Um, there were, I guess, these were former NBA players who were saying that the oh, NBA yeah. kind of puts a, I don't know, a tag on you sometimes, and, and that kind of follows you around fairly or unfairly. Do you think that tag is already on Leangelo Ball? Like, well, they've already said, you know what? He's the third of the Ball brothers. He can't play. He's not going to make it. Is that a fair tag? Well, I, I don't know if I call it fair, but I, I, I don't think it's very far from the truth. I, I don't think he's as good as Lonzo or LaMelo. I think least. that's obvious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Least right now, he's not. You know, we don't know what the future brings for those three guys. But – um. And, you know, if if he was jumping out at the scouts, then he would be. Why? I mean, sometimes it's not it's just not a good fit. Maybe yeah. Detroit, maybe the culture, the locker room, whatever, just wasn't a good fit for him. Maybe the Hornets will be a better fit for him because Lamelo is a Hornet. And he really likes being a Hornet, at least right now he does. So it might be a better fit. And I understand sometimes that can hamper a player's development. But really, if you if you're that good, OK, Malik Monk. The Hornets have hung on to Malik Monk through thick and thin, buddy. Everything. Why? <laughs> because we've seen what Malik Monk can do when he's when he's really on his game. Hey, look, as our as our main man Jerry V says, he's given us plenty of wow moments. Plenty of wow moments. So you give any team those wow moments, they will. Uh, they'll let a lot of things go. Right. Reminder: The Hornets could have. Uh, rescinded Monk's contract after the, the uh, after he failed the drug program, which led to his suspension. The Hornets could have said, "You know what? We're done." They would, and they would have freed up five million dollars in cap space. I mean, we know how valuable cap space is, especially the Charlotte Hornets, and they chose not to. They said, "Okay, nope, we're gonna give this guy another chance," and you know, and and they did. So, so the whole well, there's a tag applied to you. If you're good enough or you show enough potential, teams will ignore any stigmas that are attached to you. And that's I guess that's what Leangelo has to do. If if he or his family feels like, you know, there's some kind of unfair assumptions attached to him or preconceptions, he's he's simply got to outplay them. Yeah. Bottom line. We'll see how it goes, man. Um, I'm going to I'm going to inject another subtopic that I didn't warn you about. So, not, and this will be really quick, man. Um, I, I saw yesterday or a couple of days ago, Jared Allen signed a qualifying uh, extension with the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers for seven million dollars, man. Uh, quickly, kind of explain what that may or may not mean to the Charlotte Hornets, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. So. There's been a lot of talk about qualifying offers in the NBA because one of our own players, Monk, is expected to get one. Essentially what this means is that we don't if, – if you thought the Hornets had a chance at Jared Allen, they don't because uh, Cleveland making a, a qualifying offer <laughs> – that, that makes me sad, by the way. Qualifying offers and restricted free agency is the NBA's way of trying to achieve parity by allowing – teams, particularly small market teams, to keep good players, to keep – this is how you keep Jerry Allen from going to a better up-and-coming team like the Hornets or to a contender. Um, so this is – the same thing's going to happen to Malik Monk, although I don't think the Hornets will match any offer Monk gets that's above a certain amount. The Cavs are certainly going to match any offer Jared Allen gets. Uh, and because they offered him a qualifying offer, they have the right – that gives them the right to do that. So, Look, now, let me interject real quick. I, I don't want to get, you know, you know, this is not a, this is obviously not a Cleveland Cavaliers podcast, but does that change if they draft Evan Mobley? I don't think so. I think you draft Evan Mobley. I mean, who wouldn't want Jared Allen and Evan Mobley? Right. Uh, but playing together. You, you That's a good try. problem to have, actually. Yeah, you got to <laughs> make that work. Um I guess the question is, what's the market for Jerry Allen? Same thing for Malik Monk. What's the market for him? 
Listen, listen, man, personally, this is just my personal opinion, man. I think the market is super high for Jared Allen, man. Oh, yeah. I really yeah. do, dude. I, I I think he's made himself some money, man, during the last uh, part of the season, man. Yeah, he, he's going to be in the $20 million range. That's, yeah. Yeah, he, easy. Um, and, and the Cavaliers can match that, and they, they will match that. You know, they, they could make him a, a max offer. I don't think they'll do that. No. But, um, <laughs> you know, they'll – you know, I think he'll test the market. Most restricted free agents do see who makes him a high offer and the Cavs will match it. it, it it's as simple as that. Um, with Malik Monk, however, I don't think the market for Monk is as high as Monk thinks it is. Yeah, um, I agree. The qualifying offer is about seven and a half million. Um, to put that in perspective, Steph Curry currently makes – Eight million dollars. Uh, do you guys do you think that Malik Monk is better than Seth Curry? <laughs> uh, I, don't, no, I don't think so. I mean, I'm just saying that's what the market is, right? Um, the market for a two guard like Malik Monk with his skill set is anywhere between eight and eleven million dollars, and Monk is not going to be on the high end of that. So, uh, really, it'll come down to do the Hornets want to let Monk go? Because if the offer comes in for like eight and a half million, I think the Hornets might match that. Eight, eight and a half million. They might I think they that. should actually. Yeah, especially if, if they make if they make them a qualifying offer of seven and a half million, surely they wouldn't mind giving him eight and a half million. But anything yeah. more than that, I think the Hornets might would say, especially if Leangelo Ball plays well in the summer league, I think they might say, hmm, okay, you know what, Monk? Thanks for your time here. Or or if they draft a James Book Knight who may be available at the 11th pick, I think that may change things as well. Um, another guy I wanted to quickly talk about, man, according to uh, Sham, Sham has a uh, podcast that Rashawn Holmes is on, and apparently we are one of the team. Yeah. we, meaning the Charlotte Hornets, are one of the teams that are interested in Rashawn Holmes, man. What do you think about Rashawn Holmes, man? What do you think his market value is right now? Pretty high. You know, uh, athletic – Quick big men are also yeah Moses Moody. Moses way. Moody, he's a hot he's a hot one yeah. right now, man. Absolutely. Um, but uh, I, I think there's a market for guys like Rashawn Holmes. Um, I'm glad that the Lamelo effect is working. I think yeah. without Lamelo Ball, he doesn't even mention uh, Charlotte Hornets. But I, I think that would be man, that would be a great win for the Hornets. Uh, you know, a young talented guy. And, you know, he comes in with the already young, talented core. I think they would do a lot of, <laughs> of really, really good things. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me give you my very quick synopsis of, of Rashawn Holmes, man. And this is, this is more of a nitpick than it is a real concern. Rashawn Holmes, he's not, the, he's not a super big guy. He's not, the, he's not the super big guy that clogs the paint, so to speak. However, what he makes up for it is with his athleticism, and he is a shot blocker, and he is extremely active. As far as a fit for the Hornets, and when I say fit, I mean someone who is just perfect offensively and what we need defensively, I think he's the perfect fit. He may not be the, the guy that, that, that's going to clog up the paint like a Steven Adams or, or, or kind of redirect uh, an opposing offense like I kind of would, would want my center to be, but he does make up for it, you know, with his shot blocking and athleticism, man. I think if we could pull a Rashawn Holmes off, man, that would be a big win for us this offseason. Definitely. Hornets instantly competitive, uh, you know, if they're, if they're able to grab a player like him. And, 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 and fans, don't be surprised if we have to overpay for somebody. Like, if just, just get your complaining yeah. out of the way right now because it's coming. They're probably going to have to overpay. <laughs> Fortunately, the Hornets have a lot of cap space uh, this season, it, despite the fact that Nick Batum is still on the books, which is, is kind of crazy. Right. Also, I think that, you know, although they may end up trading the pick, uh, you know, if you're able to land with Sean Holmes and you keep the pick, that gives you a lot more leeway. It gives yeah. you a lot more leeway what you want to do with your Malik Monk, Devontae Graham situation. It it just kind of opens up doors because that's a hole that you fill. So, and hey, man, you know, speaking of that, man, you know what? You just made me think about something, man. The, the Devontae Graham situation is something that we haven't really talked about a whole lot. You know what I mean? I just, I just wonder what's his value and what do you, what do you think his chances of uh, of returning to the Hornets are? I don't think the Hornets let him go. They're going to match whatever offer he makes, whatever offer team makes him. I think that 
Devontae is probably in the $10 to $12 million range. He's a point guard that can shoot and get hot, shoot the three. Um, his deficiencies are defensive, and he cannot score on the inside. He will probably shore one of those two up this summer. Um, I think a lot of teams are going to be – a, a backup point guard. Also, this might be the, the, the biggest thing about Devontae Graham. He's willing to, to back – Lamella Baller. Right. He's willing right. to be the guy coming off the bench, running the second offense. And let me let me let me let me interject, man. I think that is invaluable. When yeah. you have a guy like that who doesn't have an ego, who says, "Look, I, put me wherever you need to put me at." How many yeah. NBA teams have point guards like that? Yeah, 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 exactly. Everyone wants to be a starter, and I'm sure Devontae Graham does too. But I think he realizes, hey, this is my role on the on this team, and this team gave me. Gave him a chance, you know. Uh, you know, he was a second round pick that was in the G League for a, a season. So, um, I mean, it, none of that matters because the Hornets really have to decide whether they want to keep him and matching whatever offer he makes. But I think they will. I think if it comes down to Monk and Graham, they'll match any offers made to uh, Devontae Graham and let Malik Monk uh, go in free agency. Yeah. Um- I'll finish this topic off with one of our with, with one of our own guys as well, man. Cody Zeller was quoted as saying, "When as I approach free agency, I do not want to be a guy that sits at the end of the bench looking for a championship." What do you make of that? And mm. How does that relate to us? Boy, that's a interesting quote from Cody Zeller. Right. Um, I think he just he's saying, "Hey, I want to contribute like I know I can." We talked about this weird relationship between Cody Zeller and James Borrego. Just, just very, very strange. <laughs> I think it may, it might come down to. Uh, we've said this before. JV is a very matchup oriented guy. If he feels like that's not a good matchup for Cody, then Cody's not going to play. I don't think Cody likes that. I think he likes the challenge of, you know, of going up against guys like Giannis. Yeah, that's not a good matchup for Cody, but hey, when they play, hey, Cody He competes, he, man. He, he competes. Got one of the best dunks of the season on Giannis. Uh so you know, I think he feels like, hey, you gotta you gotta give me a chance. And, and Coach JB is not gonna give me a chance. He doesn't wanna go somewhere else and be regulated to, you know, just a, a matchup guy. Right, 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 right. He wants a full time role, and I, I, he he knows he's probably not a starter. But right. what that says to me is that he wants to play. He he does not want to just be a cheerleader. He wants to contribute wherever he's going. Now, I thought that may be a good sign for the Hornets because I've always maintained I would not mind keeping him as a backup as long as you right. have your starter entrenched. If you have a Rashawn Holmes and you keep a Cody as a backup, I would be all for that. But with that being said, man, you know, you make a great point with his relationship with with Borrego. And it's been so I don't want to say tumultuous, but it is strange. You know what I mean? And, and we, we see stretches of games where Cody doesn't play. You'll see 10 games where he plays when he just doesn't play at all. Then you'll see another stretch where he's like the starter. And I, I don't think he likes that at all, man. I think if he goes to, a, let's say, a team like a Portland where he can come off the bench and be a full-time uh, uh, bench guy, come, come right. six-man or whatever you want to call it. I think that'll be the perfect fit for somebody like Cody Zeller. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that – plus, I mean, sometimes players' time just comes and goes on the yeah. team. I mean, his time yeah. as a Hornet has come and gone. Um, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. While it lasted. And I think the Hornets, you know, we've got Vernon Carey. Uh, and Nick Richards, uh, I'm hoping those guys will take a development step this summer. Yeah, right. And, you know, if we end up picking up a Rashawn Holmes, I think that makes the decision very, very easy um, to just let Cody go into free agency without making him a- an offer. You make a good point, man, because as much as fans have been clamoring for the almighty um, Vernon Carey, hey, Chris, if you're out there, um, <laughs> and Nick Richards, man, I, I, I want to make it clear for this podcast, man, we want to see these young guys succeed, man, but we de- we also need to see that they're ready. And this, and this offseason is going to be interesting because we don't have, you know, the COVID offseason that we had last season. We're going to have a summer league. We're going to have a full training camp. So we re- there, there's really no excuses for these young guys to, to, to not show their worth, man, and to take that 
next step in their development, man. And I'm I'm really uh looking forward to seeing that, man. All right, one uh one other quick topic that I'm just gonna throw on you, man. Yeah, that's what I'm doing today, man. I'm just I'm just throwing you curveballs today, Cos. <laughs> Bill Barnwell says that the Carolina Panthers rank seventh in the amount of offensive weapons that they have. What you, now you're the one who uh who forwarded this article to us, man. Tell tell us what you think about it. Bill Barnwell has always liked the Carolina Panthers for one. Um he's always thought very highly on last year's uh his rankings, he actually had them at number five. Um, I don't think he's too far off here. Yeah, I was going to say, should we really be surprised at that? Seriously. Yeah, I mean, offense, I don't think the the Panthers' problem were, one, the defense was just really, really bad uh, last season. But offensively, it was just, you know, they just couldn't get it together. You know, you had a new coach, new offensive coordinator. You had this weird quarterback situation. To say um, the least. <laughs> right. Christian McCaffrey spent most of the season injured. Um, I think that next season, barring injury, the Panthers offense is going to be hell to deal with. I mean, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, looks like they're, they're probably going to keep both of those guys. <clears throat> uh, you know, then you got um, – we re-signed uh, Taylor Moulton. Uh, we picked up some offensive linemen in the draft. Um, Christian McCaffrey's going to be back healthy. Uh, Sam Darnold is the big question mark. You, you, you stole my question, but go ahead, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, if, if he's serviceable, then, you know, the offense is not going to be as much as a problem. Uh, if he's trash, then off. And, and that's, that's the only question I had about Barnwell's ranking. It's like, does he really think Sam Darnold? Because I, Teddy Bridgewater came into the season with a lot more um, uh, of a good narrative from the media. Right. Sam Darnold does. A lot of people felt like Teddy Bridgewater just didn't get a chance in Minnesota, mainly, you know, due to injury. Every, they loved him when he was in New Orleans and like, man, look at what he did when Drew Brees was injured. Um, so a lot of people felt like Teddy Bridgewater to the Panthers was a great thing. Um, except for those of us that under construction, because we knew. <laughs> but, uh, so, but Sam Darnold is not coming to the Panthers with that kind of you know goodwill. A lot of people are like, yeah, Sam Darnold. Oh, okay, uh, we'll see. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, I actually when I look when I saw this list, man, without I didn't look at the rest of it. I said, how come we're not higher? I, I, I honestly I said that, man, but. I didn't even I didn't know we were including quarterbacks in this situation, so I kind of think they got the rankings right, man. But <clears throat> I mean, just kind of following off what you said, man. Going into next season, man, like I, I don't think the offense was ever a question. I think the offensive line itself was the key cog in all of this, and I think that was the main reason why we just couldn't get it together last season. You know, I've I've made mention week to week on how everything the Panthers wanted to do. Every what what they wanted their identity to be, it couldn't be executed because of lack of blocking up front, man. So right, if yeah. we if we get that corrected going to the next season, we could really be dangerous. You know, I love me some Christian McCaffrey. That is that is my boy, and I, I he could really really break out if, if we if we show those offensive line problems up, man. So I'm pretty excited going into this season. By the way, man, preseason football two weeks away. Hey, That's crazy, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, oh, speaking of football, man, we're up against time, man. So I'm gonna squeeze in this topic really quickly, man. Apparently, the city may not have enough money for David Tepper and Vi Lyle's new stadium, man. Can you believe it? What do you think? <laughs> what do you think about that? Okay, the city has never had enough money. They never had it, enough money. <laughs> um, it, it, it's funny too because they're like, well, you know, we're, we're we we decided we're gonna put money into the arts. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, Charlotte right. Stop it. Money into, and like they've ever used that as an excuse for anything. So, um, but the city says they don't have enough money from, um, you know, their tourism and hospitality funds to build a new stadium, and I'm sure they don't. So that's that's just a way of saying. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me all that money that Rich Carlton took from black people is yeah. is not gonna <laughs> yeah. not gonna be enough money? I'm I'm sorry. Let's, yep. let's move sorry. on. Go ahead. But uh, this is their way. The city's done this before, and they, they don't want the uh, the onus of a new stadium to be on the city planners. They want it to be on the taxpayers. This is exactly what they did 
It's a spectrum center. They said, let, 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 let's let's be let's be clear and let's be fair. David Tepper wants the money to come from. <laughs> well, yeah, Tepper doesn't care where the money comes from as long as it's not his bank account. Pretty much. So it could either come from the city or the taxpayers. And the city, the city could find a way to to fund that, but. They did this with what well, was then Time Warner Arena, in which they said, "Oh, we don't have the money, so we'll just let the taxpayers vote on whether they want to pay a, a tax on it." And the taxpayers said, said no. no, and they did it they, anyway. They built it anyway, which means you guys, you always had the money. What the so, heck? so, with, so with that being said, doesn't this just look like a bunch of just grandstanding oh, again? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just, just sit at the table and hammer out a deal, and and. Build a, a, a stadium. I, I would I would do this though if I'm the city. I would really hold Tepper's feet to the fire on this. Hey, if the city builds this, this is the city stadium. Right. Our stadium. You right. know, uh, or Bank of America Stadium is not owned by the city. It's owned Does by that name rights. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, it's like, hey, if we build this, you know, then it's ours, and we do whatever we want with it. Mr. Tepper, and you know, if he says no, then he's got then he's got to meet halfway. And I think I think eventually they'll hammer out a deal. Uh, Carolina Panthers are too valuable uh, for them to, you know, be all this grandstanding and not get in the state. This ha- this happens in every NFL city. Um, you, you know, what I, I found interesting about this article, man. They, they were they were kind of going over, you know, how much money it costs Atlanta, how much money it costs Dallas, and. You know, Las Vegas, it was ridiculous the amount of money. It it it, it I think it cost them like something like seven hundred uh million dollars or something like that, man. Um it doesn't matter because like you said, if they if they need the money, they'll find it some way. Right. This article may mention of like I, I guess like they're they're wanting to upgrade the convention center. Do you not think they would stop it, they will stop cold whatever they're doing to that damn convention center to take yeah. that money they need and and, and and put that towards the stadium. Like a relatively it, new convention center. Convention center is barely twenty years old. Right, you know? it's, it's very nice actually. So um, they'll they'll find a way. Like yeah. any, every NFL city goes through this because you know it's, it's such a huge spin. And I'll say this: it's more difficult for the city to make that money back than it is for the team. Um, if you build a billion dollar stadium, if you're an NFL team, if you're an NFL team, your return on investment in that is what a few seasons, maybe. Right. right, so, right. so, uh, you know, within 10 years, the stadium is paid for and insured. I think it might take longer than that for the city to be able to make back uh, that ROI. Um, yeah, imagine going to ML, ML, you know, I, I will say this Atlanta has kind of set the standard for MLS. Uh, Don't think David Tepper ain't looking either. Yeah, exactly, he's a uh, looking. So, yeah. all right, man, we we're up against time, man. I, I'm gonna ask you a very quick question before we get to shout outs. Are you listening to Kanye West's new album or not? Are you interested? You know, I'm a huge Kanye West fan. I did not know that. I, yeah. This is something new I've learned about you today. I feel like he's one of the few rap artists in history to come out the gate with like three straight classics, like. Him, Ice Cube, Nas. Yep. Yeah, but, it, but, but but these last three, brother. Not classics. Um, <laughs> you know, so I like the old Kanye, and I understand he's doing his weird pop star thing. I don't know, man. I mean, I'll probably – I mean, I have streaming services, so I'll give it a precursory listen. Right. You know. You got any shout-outs today, brother? Uh, let me get a <laughs> – <laughs> I'm going to give a quick shout-out. To Carolina Hurricanes fans. Um, yeah, y'all are freaking – I ain't going to say y'all, but the people who really follow the Hurricanes are freaking out, man. Freaking out. The Hurricanes traded away uh, their goalie, a, a prospect. He's one of the top prospects when the Hurricanes drafted him. Spent some time with the, with the checkers, the Charlotte checkers developing, uh, and then came to the Hurricanes and, and you know, played pretty well. He looked like he was going to be, like, the Hurricanes goalie of the future, and they traded him to the Detroit Red Wings. My thing is this. Throughout the entire season, Canes fans have always said, man, goaltending is an issue. Our goaltending rotation is not where it needs to be. So the Hurricanes trade away the problem, and now it's the, now it's the problem again. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, hold up, y'all was talking about, you know, it's just that the fans are, and the fans are really split. Some people are like, 
you know, good. Ned needed to go. Some people are like, oh, I can't believe we, we traded away our future. It just goes to show really, you know, how polarizing some of these things uh, can be right. fans. So, and, and the thing is, is the Hurricanes are relatively successful compared to like the Hornets. You know, the Hurricanes have a championship. Um, they had a, you know, a, a period of time where they weren't that good, but now they're a perennial playoff team again, and the fans still hate them. So, go figure. There you have it. All right, no shout outs for me, man. Shout out to Rodney. See you next week, man. Shout out to everybody in the chat room once again, man. Please like, share, and subscribe. We always appreciate y'all when you're in the chat next week. It makes our job a lot easier. Um, hopefully, I think maybe we'll be coming back to y'all Thursday. We'll cross our fingers for uh some draft night coverage. Well, we did a draft party last year. It was. Pretty, it was yeah, super I fun. I had, a super, I had a lot of fun doing that last year, man. So we did it yeah. with that well. So I think we'll do it again with. Uh, with all right. So, so with that being said, man, we will see y'all Thursday night, man. Peace and love to everybody. Y'all be safe. Take care of each other. Peace, y'all.